all, and I, I'm just very pleased to introduce Johnny Armstrong to you all. Johnny is an assistant professor in the Fisheries and Wild, Wildlife Department at Oregon State University, who works at the nexus of landscape ecology, animal behavior, and physiology to understand how animals interact with habitat conditions. I stole that from, from a website, Johnny. I hope it's still accurate, and I, I put it in a few more layman's terms because I didn't understand some of it. <laughs> Johnny is also uh, really an incredible volunteer for Greenbelt Land Trust. Um, he was our volunteer of the year in 2019. And for an organization whose uh, part, part of our mission is to inspire people to care about natural lands so that they can be conserved, um, it would be really hard for me to overstate how important and impactful great imagery of the natural world um, is to our work. Um, we're very lucky to have Johnny um, as he's an extremely generous volunteer. I'm constantly asking him for stuff, including for this presentation. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you, Johnny. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome, well, thanks for having me. And I'm just gonna, um... Let me set my screen share up. All right, can everybody see that and hear me okay? It looks good and you sound great. All right, um, well, thanks so much for giving me this chance to, um, to, to yap to people about camera trapping. Uh, many poor people over the last decade have had to hear me talk uncontrollably about my, my obsession with camera trapping. So it's fun to do it in a formal environment like this. So, um, yeah, I started camera trapping in 2011, so it's been over 10 years now. And what I wanted to do today was talk about, you know, why camera trapping? Like, what, why, why would you do this? Um, and then how I came to to get into camera trapping, and then tell you some stories about pictures that I've taken everywhere from um, from Kenya to to just the local woods around here in Corvallis. And then I'll finish with some stories about pictures that I took. Um, on, uh, on greenbelt lands and in other, uh, other er you know, natural areas right here in town. And I think these, this little mosaic of photos here, um, I'm trying to be representative of sort of the successes in camera trapping where, um, and, th and this, is, this actually is over, this is an overly optimistic display right here because most of the time you set a camera out and like a herd of cows finds it and knocks it over and slobbers all over it or a dog gets it, or maybe you set up this elaborate photo and the only thing you got was a ground squirrel jumping onto the lens. But every once in a while, uh, everything works out and you get a photo like these uh, bobcats uh, on Malky Creek at the Bald Hill Farm. So like I said, I've been using camera traps for about a decade. And before I got into using camera traps, I was really into wildlife photography and I took, um, and this is sort of, you know, the, the kind of picture I would have taken before. So this is a picture of a red fox on Kodiak Island in Alaska. And I took this using the traditional techniques in nature photography, or, or at least in wildlife photography, where you have a long lens, right? And this is definitely the most practical, effective way to photograph wildlife. And it's a beautiful way to photograph wildlife because you get that perspective where everything is compressed. And so... Um, there's this shallow depth of field and you get a sharp subject against this beautiful like painterly like out of focus background. And so this is a great way to, you know, traditional techniques are great because they're aesthetically pleasing and they produce these, you know, uh, potentially gorgeous images. And then also it's so fun, like, um, you know, you know, creeping around in the woods and getting to watch animals through a, um, a you know, your little telescope on the end of your lens is incredibly rewarding and, and most folks on the line probably like spending time outside observing animals. So it's an awesome way to do it for that. And it's a great way to document behavior. Like if you wanna get pictures of animals doing stuff, um, in general, having a long lens and traditional nature photography is the way to go. However, there are some disadvantages to it that ultimately led me to look for, you know, other ways to photograph animals. And one disadvantage or one challenge that probably anybody can relate to if you tried to get into wildlife photography is that it's a, it's gear intensive and with really expensive gear. And so, um, you know, like if you go to Yellowstone, you'll see all these mostly retired guys 
um, sitting on the side of the road and they seem to spend more time talking about each other's lenses than they do taking pictures. Um, and I think this for, you know, this can be make, make, you know, nature, I think wildlife photography seem inaccessible because, you know, oftentimes you feel like you need this really big lens and it's gotta be, you know, a wide lens that lets light in. And, and these things cost more than used cars. Um, they're incredibly expensive. I, you know, I think I used to think that these things were the most expensive things on earth, but now I have a little kids and I pay for childcare. So now that doesn't seem that expensive to me, but, but anyways, this can be a major roadblock uh, and a disadvantage of traditional techniques. But further, they, though incredibly effective, you know, photography is just this incredibly um, diverse, broad uh, art form or hobby. There's so many different techniques available. And with traditional wildlife photography just kind of holds this really narrow spot where you're kind of limited in, in the ways that you can, like the techniques that you can use. Um, you know, uh, you don't use this, you know, all these really cool other techniques like portraiture um, and lighting. We don't usually use those in wildlife photography. So there, so I think I felt like I wanted to try other stuff. Um, secondly, a lot of the animals that you might want to photograph, like carnivores, they're nocturnal or they're incredibly skittish and they can only really be effectively photographed in like a handful of places. Like, for example, if you want to photograph a wolf, you probably got to go to Yellowstone. If you want to photograph a mountain lion, there's probably one place in the world you can go and expect to be able to photograph a mountain lion with a camera in your hand. And that's like a national park in Patagonia. But if, but so what, what if you want to actually photograph these animals in your backyard? What if you want to photograph a carnivore in Corvallis where they might be largely nocturnal? Well, traditional wildlife techniques are going to make it pretty difficult to do that. And the last thing uh, that I that was kind of a shortcoming for traditional techniques for me is that oftentimes when I finally had a chance to photograph a critter, it was like, um, you know, this is part of the reason why it's really cool, but also it's a downside is that it's frantic. Like, oh my gosh, it's the one time I saw a wolf in Yellowstone Oh, my lens cap's on. Oh crap, take the lens cap off. Oh no, I have it in the wrong photo mode. Like, and I'm like cursing and like, oh no, the critter's gone, you know? And, and that's part of what makes it so exciting is it's kind of like a dynamic thing, like photojournalism. But it could also be, if you want to work slow and kind of have more creative control, it's it can be frustrating. So, um, so, you know, so then, you know, I looked, I kind of, that, these limitations kind of led me to consider alternative techniques. And it ultimately led me to do things like this, where I was posing like a mountain lion on my hands and knees on this game trail in the Siskiyou mountains, where I just found a fresh cougar scrape. And I was out there at dusk. It was getting a little bit spooky. I found super fresh cougar sign. And here I am like trying to dial in this lighting on this camera trap set. So this is how I, this is how I take pictures of wildlife now. And I'm going to, give a quick narrative of the kind of funny path by which I arrived at, you know, doing stuff like this. And so it all started with an impulsive purchase of the Canon. Canon like sells used stuff on this refurbished website. And they saw, I saw there was like a flash. I had no need for a flash whatsoever, but it was like, it's half off. It, I think it's like that Fred Meyer marketing trick where they always like selling the diamond ring that's like marked down 60%. But I just had, I, was, I just bought this flash. I just did it. And this flash showed up and I was like, what am I going to do with this? And I, st I started Googling around how to use it. And I discovered this website that is just a, a real gem in the internet age where this fella, um, David Hobby, a former journalist for the Baltimore Sun. He's just obsessed with, with, with teaching lighting photography. And he has a free website where he just takes you behind the scene of every, every like professional job he's ever done and tells you about how he uses light and why he uses it. So basically I started nerding out online and then torturing my friend's pets and taking pictures. Now I didn't torture this cat. Like I didn't throw the cat in the air. If you see this little thing here, this little feather toy that encouraged it to jump. But uh, so I started just messing around. I had no idea what I was doing. Started taking pictures of my friend's pets because I am a nature, I'm an, you know, I'm a wildlife photographer. So I'm not interested in taking pictures of people generally, unless they are feral people like my children. Um, and so I started getting into, um, using lighting on pets and, and, and it became just like my passion for, for a short period of time. And so here's a picture I took of my in-laws dog 
And here's pictures I took of my friends' chickens, goats, and dogs. And I really liked it. What's funny about it is I use artificial light, but it oftentimes actually makes the scene look more natural because our eyes can see this incredible range of tones that our cameras can't. So if you look right now, like into the sun, you can still see details in like the shadow on the side of your house, but your camera can't see this. So actually using light, using artificial light oftentimes actually lets you render the world, sometimes in ways that are kind of like, you know, um, surreal, but oftentimes sometimes in ways that are actually more how our eyes see it. So I, I just started getting super into um, mixing natural light with a little bit of flash. And this is all I wanted to do with my photography. But after, you know, torturing all my friends' pets, I thought, you know, how cool would it be if I could do this with, with wild animals and, and, and kind of circle back to nature photography? So I did that um, for a while. This is a, when I was in grad school at, in uh, Seattle, I took this picture of a, um, of a very habituated human that hung out next to a jogging path right behind the UW Husky Stadium. And I had a flash like 100 feet off camera. And on this frosty morning, I took this picture and I started to really see the potential to just to add a little bit of flash in my nature photography. So I started doing that and then applied it all across the animal kingdom. Here's a invasive cane toad in Kauai, a wading bird in Florida, a little fiddler crab in Hawaii. And here's an Arctic grayling. I was getting into underwater photography at the same time. And I, was, I did all my um, graduate research. I still do some of my research up in Alaska. And I worked on these salmon spawning streams where when you walk up the stream, you yell hay bear at the top of your lungs and like several bears leave the stream. And there's like, uh, there'll be like salmon with their heads like bitten off that are still like breathing, uh, lying in the stream. And so you're working in very close proximity to bears. I thought, oh man, I'd love to try to take a picture of a bear like this. But um, I didn't have time to take pictures of bears, you know, like during, the, there was no time to like go out and, and with my camera and try to sneak around. And where I worked in Alaska, it wasn't the kind of place where you can, you know, places like um, Katmai, you can go up there, walk 60 feet from a bear and take all the pictures you want. Um, but this was a place that was brushy. The bears were not at all habituated to humans. And if you try to go sneak it around with the camera, like it would not be a good outcome. And so I started thinking, I knew about camera traps because we had some trail cameras up there for research. But I started thinking, is there a way that I could um, like, you know, take photos like this of grizzly bears using like, you know, like a camera trap approach. And so um, I went for it and I, I made a, a very bad decision, which is that they actually, there was a, a commercially available camera trap trigger that you could use with like modern camera gear. Um, but it was, it was, it seemed like it was too expensive at the time. And the guy who sold them was, was kind of obnoxious. So like, I was like, I'm going to make my own camera trap trigger. And so I scoured the internet and there's all these like interesting, like online communities where people like to make little like robotic things and like automate, you know, like automate their sprinkler system. And so there's this whole kind of scene of people getting these little microcontrollers and then putting sensors on them and then getting the microcontrollers to do things. Um, for example, there's a, a fella who lives um, right up near Mulkey Ridge, whose property I camera trap on sometime. He's a retired engineer and he uses, I'm pretty sure he uses the same sort of thing to like check whether his mail has been delivered. So you can do all this cool kind of custom programming with like a $30 board. Long story short, I scoured the internet and I found a tutorial on how to control your camera with a motion sensor. So I did it and I thought, sweet, I got a camera trap now. But when you try to go do something, like put something like this in the field, unfortunately, um, you know, the online tour tutorials are like a proof of concept. Just do it on your you know, computer desk and call it good. But then you go leave it out in nature and you realize that the batteries, you know, some part the batteries die in an hour, another part three hours. So it took me about a month to figure out just all the kind of tricks to get to this to the point where it could run out in the wild. And then I got this award-winning picture of a grizzly bear, probably one of the best pictures of a grizzly bear ever taken. Um, okay, so it, it was a huge success and then my camera trap worked, but it wasn't a good photo. But this is the first camera trap picture I ever got. And I put my camera out and it was using this, the, this cheap plastic lens and the focus ring slid. Um, so it was a blurry picture, it was not a, a good picture, but it was like, oh my gosh, it worked. 
So the next night, uh, this is this is like uh, in the bush in, in Southwest Alaska. And the next night we went to the salmon spawning stream. I was too afraid to put my recently created camera trap on the stream. So we took a spawned out salmon from the stream and we threw it in this field next to the stream. And we put the camera on it and we came back the next day and the, and the, the salmon was gone. Oh, no, wait, the salmon was still there, I think, actually, I take it back. But everyone was crowded around. It was like, okay, what do you, do you think we got a picture? And we all crowded around and we looked at the camera and this was the picture we got. So we were expecting to get this bear and we got this young bull moose that had come in to sniff the camera during the, like, you know, uh, the forever Alaska twilight at night. But everybody was just going nuts. It was like, what? A moose? Oh, and it's a cool picture. Like, it feels like you're standing right next to the moose and it's looking in your eyes. Like it's very different than like a telephoto image. And then this was the moment I was just complete. I was probably hooked already, but just this, the surprise um, was just really fun. So the next, the next trap that we set, I was finally like, all right, I'm ready to put my camera on the stream. So there was just a little sliver of a gravel bar in the middle of this riffle. And there was salmon carcasses around. So we took one of the salmon carcasses and we put it on this gravel bar. Then I took an ultra wide uh, lens on my camera and put my camera just right, like maybe 10 inches away from the salmon carcass. And then we got, and then two hours later, this bear came and ate it. And then this is like, it's almost like cheating in Alaska. Cause there's, you know, there's like uh, a million salmon spawn in this basin and there's bears everywhere eating them. But um, so then I got this picture and then it was like, whoa. And then everything just kind of took off. And I started getting pictures everywhere. And the next thing you know, anytime I traveled anywhere, I'd bring my little camera trap with me. Started setting camera traps in Oregon, Montana, Washington. Um, and just kind of stopped doing all other photography. And my passion was camera trapping. And one of the things I think is hilarious about developing this hobby is that like Liam Neeson in the critically acclaimed movie Taken, I have a very particular set of skills now. And I think it's a combination of skills that no normal human being would ever have. And I probably have the weirdest internet search history on the planet. And that's because it combines like uh, fur trapping, just extreme redneck pursuits. Um, of course, I have no interest in like physically trapping animals, but it's the same sort of like approach. Um, electronical engineering, soldering, circuitry wiring that kind of thing and then um very elaborate kind of like i used to think of it as like fashion photography lighting because i would read blogs on fashion photography to try to understand how to like do this stuff but i realized it's actually more complicated and the stuff that you do as a camera trapper is actually analogous to what's called night exteriors which is when in a movie they have to light an out light uh, an outside scene and make it look like moonlight and they get 100 foot tall cranes and lights that are powered by generators. That's the same kind of, I obviously don't achieve that level of cinematic beauty and I don't have that gear, but that's actually this, the analogous thing because here, I won't go down a deep rabbit hole, but they're just trying to light, you know, a two by three foot section of a, of a human being. Whereas in a camera trap set, you're trying to light a vast scene the same way you would in a movie. So it's actually, it's really tricky is the, is a long story. So I have this weird skill set and, um, And I, a funny story about red fox urine. I made the mistake when starting out camera trapping. This is the worst mistake you can make, which is that coyotes are the numerically dominant carnivore on the landscape. They are the most abundant, interesting critter that you might want to go out and camera trap. They are virtually impossible to camera trap because humans tried to wipe them off the face of the earth. And the only ones that survived are the ones that like are so good at, at sniffing out humans. Um, so anyways, I wasted like two years trying to camera trap coyotes. And I realized I would see their tracks going down like a trail and then they'd get like 60 feet from my camera and they'd split. So I read online that you need to cover your, um, your human scent with red fox uh, urine. So I sprayed all my camera trap gear with red fox urine. And it had the incredible effect of making all my camera trap gear smell like red fox urine, but it did not give me any pictures of coyote. And I also messed around with all these crazy animal scent lures that smelled terrible and created me a lot of, um, a lot of potential uh, issues in my relationship with my wife when she accidentally got some on her hand once. But then I discovered they don't actually work. Like 
in the vast majority of the time they don't work. And the, and the best way, and I think what probably most fur trappers know is that the best way to get a picture of an animal on a camera trap is to figure out where that animal goes and put your camera there. And trying to attract an animal to your camera um, is pretty tricky. All right, so for those in the audience that are interested and they might be in the photography themselves, uh, here's a picture of my camera trap when my now five-year-old was much younger. And here's a picture of a set that I actually made just off of Walnut in Corvallis after there was a, um, a, a bunch of cougar sightings back there. And um, I tried to get a picture of a, of a mountain lion in someone's backyard, didn't work out. But here's my camera on a tripod with a little uh, shield here to keep the rain off the lens. And so I shoot, I don't make my camera waterproof because I, I find it messes up the pictures. So I just, I have a little tube that my lens goes through, but then I just shoot through air and not through glass. I wasted a lot of really good pictures with you know fog on the lens and, and weird stuff. Here I have a motion sensor and then here's a little flash here and then my lighting assistant, of course. Um, so, and I, I use uh, like entry level full frame cameras so that they work well in low light. And I, they're like, I use ones that are like 10 years old. I usually look for them used. And then the funny thing is the, the only flash that works for camera trapping was made by Nikon and like the, I think they discontinued it in the 2000s. So now it's a growing hobby and like everybody bids on eBay for this flash that costs, it should cost like 45 bucks. Now it costs like 80, but it's still inexpensive compared to a new flash. Um, then, and now folks are actually starting to make gear specifically tailored for camera trapping. So I use that. And a friend of mine who's actually um, makes custom remote photography gear for like Nat Geo photographers, um, he sends me stuff to uh, test out. So luckily I, I have all this cool gear that I get for free from him usually um, to kind of test out before he sends it out with like Joel Saltori, who's his neighbor. Um, and my gear lasts for about eight weeks. Um, depending right now, the stuff that I use, I have to go swap the batteries out actually every two weeks, but I can get up to about eight weeks if I want. Um, and everything's set to manual, not because I'm a purist, but just because I find that for the kind of stuff with camera trapping, it just doesn't, doesn't really work to, to have the auto settings as much as I would like them. All right. And so I'm going to quickly jump and start taking you through some different camera trap sets that I've done, but I first wanted to share my camera trap philosophy that I've since abandoned since having kids and getting a job um, or a more strenuous job. But this is like the, um, the kind of like the, the guiding principles that, that help me get better pictures, which is first, rather than going out into the woods and being like, oh, I wonder, um, oh, look, there's some animal sign. Maybe we get this animal here. That is a practical way to approach camera trapping. But what I try to do is start with is to fully capitalize on the creative options you have with camera trapping. I try to start with an idea, like, um, you know, think like what would be a cool way to take a picture of this, of some species that would kind of capture, you know, what this species is about, unique things about this species and render them in like a unique way. So in theory, I like to start with an idea like that. Um, then I also try to make sure that every shot is better than the last. So like, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, it's spring, I'm gonna go set, um, start thinking about setting for bobcats. Um, and oh, maybe I'll set for bobcats on this new, new spot. And sometimes I do that, but I try to kind of think, okay, what bobcat shots do I have? How could I get a shot that's better than the one I got last year? Um, this is an important one. Don't give in to skittish critters. So like, what this means is that um, if you, go all in on just getting the picture and making sure that the animal is going to walk in front of your camera, you will start capitulating to the animal and like, you won't make a cool picture because you'll be like, Oh, I don't know that flash. I think it's going to see my light stand. And Oh, I think I need to like, uh, basically you'll start doing things um, that would make sense if you were like on a photojournalist assignment to get a picture of a specific animal. But um, I find that, that like, if I, I find that it's better to just, say, hey, you know what? The skittish animals in this population are probably not gonna walk in front of this camera because I left too much human scent dialing in the photo and I, don't, I didn't, my light stand is, is too close. Um, let those critters go and, um, and realize that there's some bolt, there's probably gonna be a bolder individual that will let you get the photo you want. Maybe it's like 
like with grizzly bears, it's probably like a teen. I always get pictures of these teeny bopper grizzly bears that are like, they probably, their mom probably just kicked them out and they're out like testing their, um, you know, they're the ones that are actually dangerous because they, they like, you know, they're not scared of humans. And anyways, those are the ones you're looking for for camera trapping because they're, they're off, they're not as smart as like the old wary bears that, that will like smell a human scent from a mile away or whatever. Okay. And then lastly, take risks, not with the wild animals, but, um, usually my photos, um, they're dialed in for a specific species at a specific time of day. And sometimes as crazy as it sounds, even a specific phase of the moon. Um, so you got, and if you try to take a picture that'll work for any critter, any time of day, um, then it's probably not going to be that remarkable of a shot. So for example, these are all photos that failed because I, I took risks that were maybe dumb in hindsight, but like this is the picture I took, I set up for a Pacific Fisher. And so I wanted like an up close full frame shot of that tiny little weasel beast. And, but then I was surprised by this mother black bear that this is in the Siskiyou's, this mother black bear and her little spring cub came through. It would have been an awesome shot, but I was set for the Fisher, but it's still, I find it's better just to go focus on one animal, set it for that animal and don't try to just get them all. And then this is a leopard. I took a long exposure of this leopard trying to get it at twilight, um, but it, it was too high in the frame. So it became see-through. This is another picture of a leopard where I tried to put the light in front of the camera, but that would have required in order for that to like rim light the cat, it needed to get in between the light and the camera and it triggered too early, kind of messed up the shot. And this, this can be devastating because sometimes you wait like a year to get a picture, you finally get the animal and then you, you made some dumb decision and it didn't work out, but I like to still take those risks. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk through a series of um, photos of some of my favorite ones that I thought would be like a, a mix of different pictures. So this is me when I was in grad school and right next to our field camp at this really remote place in, in Bristol Bay, there's a game trail that we'd walk when we had to kind of walk overland to get to this lake. And my, my PhD advisor, Daniel Schindler, he noticed that there was um, sap running down it and big tufts of brown hair on it. So we realized it was a, um, one of these rub trees that, that grizzly bears use. Um, I'm not a bear biologist, but I think they use it. Partly they probably just like to scratch their back and partly they use it as a way to kind of communicate and figure out what bears are there and let other bears know that they are there. So we found this and there was a bite like seven and a half feet or so up this tree, there's this big bite. And so the bears, we think that, I think this is what they do. They, they'll stand up and bite as like an honest signal to the other bears of how big they are, right? So if you, if you can bite like eight feet of the tree, it means you're a giant bear. And then the other bears know that there's like a, a bigger one around. So we, we saw this tree and it was like, whoa, there's a big bear here. Um, and so here, um, I thought, okay, what, how can I get a cool picture of a grizzly bear on a rub tree? Um, and I, I got, first I got some photos of, a, um, of, a, of bears just scratching their back. And then I thought it'd be really neat to get a bird's eye view one from in the tree of the bear scratching. So my PhD advisor, he got up in the tree. He's very fond of using duct tape. Any excuse to try to put things together with duct tape, he's all over it. So he duct taped my, my camera box like to the tree um, and we somehow got it set up and then came back and, and got this image of the bear as it was like slithering up the tree. And then I got another one of it biting the tree, just like, right, you know, you, you could only see like its nose as it was biting the tree, like running under my camera. So that was a super fun shot that I was really excited about. And this also inspired me then, um, I think it was la a year ago, last spring, I set a bird's eye shot just like this on a game trail um, across town. I got this picture of a, of a mountain lion. And so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to, um, how to get this shot when the animals are wider angle, but it's something I'm, I, I enjoy kind of exploring. All right, this was a crazy idea, the light panel. So um, one of the, so in lighting photography, like if you went and you got a portrait shot, they would try to use soft flattering light. It has this very kind of just beautiful look to anything it hits. And the key to getting soft light, a lot of photographers mess this up. It's not to put a, you have to put a diffuser on the light, but what determines how beautiful and soft it is, is the size of the light source 
relative to the subject. So if you want to make soft light on a grizzly bear, you need a giant source of light. Hence, we made the light panel where I got ripstop nylon. And then my friend who was a painter helped me uh, make this frame and then stretch it around it. And so we made this giant light panel and then I hid it up in a tree with a flash behind it so that it would make a giant soft light source and I could take the first ever soft light photo of a grizzly bear. And so this is it. So, and I, I don't know if, if, maybe you have to be a lighting nerd to kind of like to see this, but so here I had the light source coming from up here and this young brown bear was walking up this game trail on the side of Pitt Creek in Alaska. And I snapped this shot of it. And again, um, you know, this thing, I don't, I don't think the bears could see it because it was at first, because it was tucked away, but a smart bear probably would not have come through here, but this was this young rambunctious bear that, that allowed me to get these photos. So this is a photo using the light panel. Um, here's another photo I got of another young blonde grizzly bear on the, with this blooming fireweed next to it. So it's probably August in Alaska. Um, and then the, the, so I, I gave up on taking these soft light photos because it's just not very practical. And I think animals, unlike humans, animals look pretty good with hard light. Um, like if you shoot me with a flash without a diffuser, it's, my skin's gonna look all shiny and like, it's gonna, I'm gonna look all contrasty and my wrinkles are gonna look really dark. But furry animals actually look pretty good with hard light. So I don't really mess with this anymore. But the last photo I took with soft light is one of my favorites I've ever taken which is this photo of a, um, of a red fox in Alaska um, where, yeah, I have a, I have a soft light uh, diffuser up above it. And this is right as a, as a storm was blown in from the Gulf of Alaska, just really fortunate to get this shot. Okay, so next, another tree photo. So I got um, a really, I was really fortunate to get a chance to go to um, Kenya and Tanzania to, to camera trap because when I was living in Wyoming, a, a researcher over there um, wanted to take me there to, to help him get photos to communicate the science that he was doing and to help fundraise for it. So my wife and I got to go to Kenya in 2015 and we basically um, got to just go to this um, kind of reserve um, and have our, and pretty soon we just had our own land cruiser and we got to just cruise around and set camera traps. So this in hindsight was not a good idea because we we're in this remote area and I was climbing up this tree over this hippo pond, it would not have been good if I fell. Like, I don't know where the nearest medical help would have been. And, it, and there's hippos in this pool. But luckily I was very careful. And if you can see in this photo here, I mounted a camera trap up in this tree. And I wanted a picture of a leopard in a tree because they're kind of a defining feature of leopards is that they're like, an, you know, an arboreal cat. Um, and they go up in the trees to cache their kills. But I, I wasn't going to be able to find a leopard kill, and I didn't really want to mess with the leopard's kill, so I faked the shot. So what I did is I, I knew that there was a leopard that almost every night would come by the bottom of this tree as it walked the river. So, and there was a dried up, I don't know where it came from, but in this field camp, there was a dried up like zebra tail. Um, so I hung this, the dried up zebra tail from a branch and put some wacky scent lure that the researchers had on it, and it like dangled around. And then I put my camera up there and nothing happened except for the vervet monkeys kept messing with my camera. Um, but the last night that we were there, this leopard came flying up the tree to check it out. And I got this single image of it zipping up the tree. And it, and it was, it was really exhilarating and fun. You can see, if you look closely, you can see these ticks on its eye. You can see there's all this, some of the fun detail you get with these shots. Um, I wish I could go back and like, and, and light the background and, and, and kind of, light the photo with the skills I have now, but still it was really fun. And I have this printed in my house somewhere. Um, but that photo almost didn't work. And indeed virtually, you know, like 90% of these ideas don't pan out. And here's one that would have been my favorite shot ever if it worked, I think. And so the first year I moved to um, Corvallis, I, um, I set a camera on, um, uh, this is Mount Jefferson in the background. So this is like, I think it's Green Ridge. This is by the McKenzie. So I rode my bike for like five miles down the locked, past the locked gate on the, I'm um, oh, sorry, the, the Metolius. So I rode my bike down towards Lake Billy Chinook in that, in that kind of remote part you can get to on the Metolius. And then I hiked up the hillside until I got a view of uh, Mount Jefferson here. And I found this ridgeline game trail. 
Um, and it looked like the perfect place to find a cougar. So I set my camera there and what I was hoping for was a long exposure night, long exposure night shot with this kind of V of the trees framing Mount Jefferson in the background and a cougar in the foreground, which, you know, it's, a lot of things would have had to go right for this shot to work. Like it would have had to, uh, a mountain lion would have had to walk on this trail. It would have had to come the direction that my lights were pointing. And then it would have had to come at night because I set a long exposure night shot and no mountain lion ever came, um, but something triggered it at night. So here's what was, here's what was painful about this one is first a bat or something triggered it. And it turned out there, there were controlled burns. I'm not sure if the Warm Springs tribe or someone was doing them, but there were controlled burns going on. So the night picture was this stunning shot of like night skies with the mountain. And the mountain was like flanked in fire because of the controlled burns. So it would have been a stunning shot. Plus when I went to pick up the camera, my wife found this cougar scrape and fresh cougar tracks like 30 feet from the camera. So there was a cat in the area but for, you know, I just, you know, it just didn't walk by my camera. So this, this is a, this is a photo I'd like to go for again, um, but it didn't work out. Um, but speaking of mountain lions, sometimes, um, especially with mountain lions, like um, my shots haven't been planned. They've kind of just been opportunistic. And here's an example. When I lived in Laramie, um, it was really frustrating because there was great wildlife opportunities around there. But if, if anybody's ever lived, in Southeast Wyoming or, or, or that area, it's one of the windiest places in the US here, like 7,000 feet. And in the winter, the wind blows like 60 miles per hour most weeks up on the ridgelines. And so you can't actually go out and track animals there because the tracks get filled in with snow immediately. And the only time that the wind dies usually is in cold snaps. So we finally had a cold snap, it was like 20 to 30 below. And I bundled up and took all my, you know, bundled up and took my friend's dog and went out looking for animal tracks. And I, I went to this uh, one spot that was kind of one of my favorite spots. And right away I cut these incredibly fresh mountain lion tracks where you could kind of see, you could see like fox tracks from the night before and you could tell they kind of been filled in. And then there was this track next to them and it was like, oh wow, this looks like it's like minutes old. Um, and I was too afraid to forward track this uh, animal so I backtracked it, right? So I followed the tracks backwards and they, they led out of a ravine. And as I walked towards the ravine, a golden eagle and a bunch of magpies came flying out. And I, and I knew from, from hanging around the woods, like if you ever see an eagle in the winter, when you're up in the mountains, it usually means that, that something killed something nearby. Um, and sure enough, I found this cached, I don't know if you can see here, but there's a mule deer, that's its uh, tongue sticking out. And it did, a cougar had killed this mule deer maybe that morning or the night before and buried it. It quickly filled its stomach and buried it in the snow. Um, so right there, I was like, okay, I got to get my camera trap on this. Um, and so I, I jogged back to my car. I called, like, I started just going through my phone contacts, calling people to see if they would come back out there with me to set a camera. Finally, um, my friend Bailey, I got a hold of him and we came back out at like 3.30 or so PM. And I had parked my, you know, I was parked at this trailhead and in broad daylight, we get out and uh, I see that my boot tracks have cat tracks of room, like from when I was there earlier. So I, it was, I'm sure it was harmless, like, but I think this cat either, either just took the same route out or maybe it was like, who is this person I'm interested in? I'm going to like, I'm going to check out this person and their dog. But so we, we quickly went up and uh, it was start, you know, it was middle of winter starting to get dark, but my fingers were all frozen, but we set this camera. And then what was crazy is that I didn't know this, but um, when it gets cold, you know, batteries die. So here I was, I think it was gonna be my first opportunity to get a good picture of a cougar. And I set the camera and as we're going to leave it, my camera's like, gives me the red flashing low battery light. And so I just turned it off and then I, or I let it go into standby mode. And then I crossed my fingers and left. I figured I wasn't going to get a picture, but we left and then like it got dark and, and probably half an hour later, this mountain lion came in and, and came back and started, you know, it was really, it, it was cool because it made me think about biology differently because I realized, you know, first night this cat probably filled up, filled its entire stomach in like, you know, 15 minutes and then it comes back. Um, but it was there, it was there all night because it had to, um, 
it was 30 below. So this thing was just frozen solid. So then it just worked its way. You can see it's got fur in its mouth in this picture. So that was one of my favorite pictures. And I, and I really liked how that, how it's kind of gruesome, but how I framed the foreground with the cat's tongue. And now I have this, I have a 40 by 60 of this printed on my living room that I traumatized my kids with. Um, so then, so that was a fun one. Then speaking of surprises, I've had, you know, a lot of times you get surprises, but they actually work out. Um, so here's um, one of the, something I still kind of like fret about, but I'm glad I made the decision, but I passed up one of the best camera trapping opportunities ever, which is that I had this really amazing experience with my wife and her uh, parents' dog. We were out exploring in Montana and I, I cut fresh wolf tracks and I followed them and I started finding tufts of fur and I followed them to a freshly killed bull elk, like giant bull elk that had been killed maybe earlier in the morning. And, uh, and I had my camera trap with me, but there was like 30 feet of red snow surrounding the bull elk. And there's something about seeing that it was just so wild. Like I think the scene after like a whole pack of wolves takes down a big animal like that. And I didn't really want to interfere with the wolves. And I had my friend's dog, or I had my par my in-laws dog with me. And it just seemed like a, a bad idea to hang around instead of camera. So I left it. Um, but I still wonder about what kind of picture I might've gotten if I, you know, with like giant antlers and like a pack of wolves in the background. But I passed that opportunity up, but I came back the next year and I tried to get the wolves um, on this. I knew that there were a lot of elk around here and there was this game trail. So I sat here for those wolves. But I never got the wolves, but I did get this little um, consolation prize of this red fox that came through. And this is a long exposure night shot, which is always fun because you never know what you're going to get. So in this one, though it's kind of sad in terms of like nature and pristine environments, the resort of Big Sky is like, Big Sky Montana is like 10 miles to the west. And it probably in combination with Bozeman created this light pollution that made it so the sky registered with all this color and, and kind of like, and lit up the clouds so it wasn't just jet black. Um, so again from, and then here's another example of surprises. So this is the fella, this is um, Jake Goheen, really amazing um, uh, community ecologist uh, that works in, in Kenya. And this is his uh, research assistant, a, a local uh, Kenyan named Toby. And so they brought me down here and they really wanted pictures of aardvark or aardwolf, which are, are sorry, aard, aardwolf. Aardwolf look like a miniature striped hyena and, and they're freaking adorable. Check them out on the internet. Like you just want to pet one. But both of these animals, um, they eat termites. And so our goal for like the month when we were down there was to get a picture of these animals on termite mounds. And so I brought my box, I had an entire tote of camera gear for this specific um, uh, set. And, and side note, when I got, when we flew from um, like Belgium to, to O'Hare airport on the way home, and I went to, to get this uh, tote for customs, only the lid arrived. Um, it was just the lid, but somehow I was able to actually get the second half of it back later. But so anyways, here's me setting up a camera trap on this termite mound. Um, and we thought for sure we'd, we'd get an aardwolf or an aardvark. But instead, um, I got the nether quarters of a, of a bull cow here. Um, and this, so this is a herd of, of cows coming through. And this, so this is, and this is land where there's uh, still Maasai herders that, um, that use the land. And so I was like, I'm going to the photos like, what cows? Um, and then I got this, this picture of a Maasai herder coming through. And he's looking at my camera gear, similar to being like, what on earth is that? Um, but this is what was cool. This is 5, 10 PM. And then at 5, 17, I got this picture of a pair of blackback jackals. It's one of my favorite photos ever. And, and they stay together as like mating pairs and you can see they're cruising over this. And I think they probably, um, I bet they follow the cows to pick up like rodents and, and bunnies and stuff that get displaced by them. So it seemed like there was some kind of cool symbiosis going on there. Then the next night, I got this mysterious looking beast that's a serval. And you may have read about a serval in the news lately because some Yahoo around Clackamas area, I think, had one as a pet and it scratched like a policeman recently. 
It was described in the in Oregon Live as a Savannah house cat, I think, but it was a pet serval. And then a leopard came through. So it was just wild. And then I think, you know, I got also got a bad-eared fox and a giraffe in the background. So a wild bunch of surprises, and we never ever got the Ard Wolf, but still had all this fun. Um, and here's another set. We set this for a leopard that was that we thought was going to cruise up here. And we we crouched over the camera the next day and looked, and here we are checking what we got. And it was a Zorilla, Zorillo, which is an African skunk. And it just it kind of just popped up and like struck this awesome pose. Um, and then we also got this picture of a leopard. So so in that case, we, we had success. Um, sometimes you get bad surprises. So I was trying to get a picture of an endangered grevy zebra, a, just a, a gorgeous animal. It's like a normal zebra, but it's stripes and like halfway down its body. And it's got these big uh, ears that look like satellite dishes. And the, the cows came through and they knocked my camera over and it came out of the camera box and the lens landed perfectly on this rock and shattered the front element. So it's like a perfect storm. Um, so that didn't work out. And then this was one of the, my favorite camera trap shots that I ever set. And there's kind of a cool ecological story with this one, which is that the historical grazing practices of the Maasai, they would hold cows in a concentrated area and that would graze the shrubs down to like grass, to like this like putting green. And then after they left the area, the herbivores, a wide, a wide range of herbivores, they go there at night because they want to be places where they can see a long ways away and that keeps them safe from predators. So then wild animals actually maintain these habitats and, and heavily use them. And my friend was studying this. So I was trying to get a picture at night of like big groups of animals, um, you know, using these grazing lawns. So I got a picture of a giraffe but before I could get any other pictures, um, an elephant stepped on, knocked my stuff over and stomped on my camera and snapped this lens perfectly in half. And then hyenas chewed out my flashes. Um, so it, it was not a successful set. So that was a bad surprise. And then one last note about surprises is that anytime you set a night picture, it's always a surprise because you go out in the day. So here's my wife, Jesse, and I'm, we're trying to cast a shadow on her so that I can kind of see how a light would look. But you set it during the day. Here's another example. But you have no idea, like, you know, what's going to come and what the light's going to be like. And then, you know, you get a picture like this. This is a striped taina that came through. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's really challenging because, um, you know, you're, you're trying to just imagine what the night scene is going to look like. And you, there's no way to test like the flashes. You kind of have to just wing it and then kind of like learn, kind of just memorize what works and what doesn't. Um, here's a fun local surprise. So I set this picture for um, a fisher in the Siskiyous and instead I got a gray fox. And this is at 3 a.m. So it kind of looks like a daytime sky, but this is because this, fo this fox came through on the super moon. And so my camera recorded it as like this bright sky. So that, again, it's like just kind of a fun surprise that like that shows you kind of how, you know, just anyways, it was, that was that was a fun one. Um, and then circling back to that cougar shot, one time my light didn't recycle. I got maybe 30 pictures of this cat. And this was one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. That was an accident. So the light didn't recycle. So I basically didn't oversaturate the scene and I had much more like texture and shadow. And then this little light that I stashed in the background, it lit up the cougar's breath as it was working so hard to, to try to get into this cat, into this deer. So again, just a kind of fun, a failure that actually benefited me. All right, so we're, we're to Oregon now. So I'm getting close to the end. Um, and uh oh, are we using the chat dialogue? Well, anyways, should I check the chat? I haven't been checking the chat just in case anyone's trying to get in, but I think we're good. Okay, um, okay so I'm gonna, all right, so um, I'm just gonna close this real quick. All right, so since, oh crap, hold on a sec. Uh, okay, can I go? Okay, awesome, I just having trouble going back. So just wanted to really quickly share that uh, one of the things that I've kind of hit pause on, but it's maybe my overarching um, kind of project that I'd like to do in Oregon 
is photographing our rare small carnivores. And I didn't know about this till I moved here and started talking to biologists, but we have all these cool ones that I think Oregonians don't know about. For example, did you know that we have ringtail cat in Oregon? This is by Lost Creek Lake. I, th I thought ringtail cat only lived in like Baja, but we, they're actually abundant in, in the dry parts of Southern Oregon. And this is one that ODFW radio collared that's uh, just outside of um, Shady Cove. This is a Pacific fisher that lives in the Siskiyous. Um, this is right outside of Ashland, Oregon. It's actually the um, really probably one of the areas with the highest density of Pacific fisher in the world. This is, not, this is also a fisher, but one of the things I really wanna get, I've gotten um, Martin up in the Cascades, but really fun, cool fun fact about Martin is that in Oregon, American Martin either live above 5,000 feet in the high Cascades or at sea level just south of Florence in the dunes. So there's sort of a recently maybe rediscovered population there that actually lives in the coastal shrub, like, um, you know, in the dunes and I'm dying to try to photograph it, but uh, it's, you know, it's, I wanna get them when they have a fur coat in, the, in a full, more full coat in the winter, but it rains, so it'd be tricky. And then I, I put this picture of the fox because um, we also have the Sierra Nevada red fox. I don't know if folks have heard of that but biologists thought it was ex near extinction and only lived in Yosemite and that it was one of the rarest mammals on the planet. And then ODFW in doing camera trap surveys for Wolverine discovered that they, that they live on virtually every like major cascade volcano. There's a little population of them. So I, I spent a summer trying to get them on three fingered Jack, but didn't have any luck. Okay, so since moving to Oregon and, and having uh, little kiddos, at first, I was I was pretty limited, so I started camera trapping my backyard, and I could use more uh, uh, flagrant, uh, less you know conspicuous setups because I was working with animals that live in your backyard. So there's a picture of a Douglas squirrel that I got in our backyard, and then there's a picture of a, a gray fox. And, and I don't know if folks know this, but gray fox are I think I'm not a I'm not a wildlife biologist, but I think they're super abundant in Corvallis, and actually maybe more abundant than they are in the woods around town. If I put a trail camera on, my, on the fence in my backyard, within a night, I'll get a gray fox on it. Um, and you just never see them because they're nocturnal and, and a little bit elusive. So this is a, this is a gray fox uh, in the garden in, my, in our backyard. And then um, one of the luckiest things to happen to me in my camera trapping is that I was at um, a fundraising event for the daycare uh, that my daughter Hayden went to. And I met some, some, some poor guy was nice enough to start talking to me. And I started chatting his ear off about my camera trapping hobby. And that was Matt Blakely Smith. And I didn't have a Matt photo of Matt on hand, but I did Google Matt Blakely GLT and this photo popped up, which I think is just maybe Matt, just maybe about five years ago with his man bun. I'm not sure. Um, but anyways, through meeting Matt, I was introduced to the Greenbelt Land Trust and Matt was incredibly kind and welcoming and said, Hey, you should try doing some camera trapping on some of our properties. And um, this is when our kids were much smaller. They were probably zero years old. And so we went out and we started setting trail cams and kind of doing the legwork to try to try to figure out what was out there and where we could potentially set some fancier camera traps. And it, it actually took a long time to figure things out because if you set a camera, so this is from Bald Hill Farm and, and the Bald Hill natural area. And if you set a camera trap in most places, you just get turkey and deer. But interestingly, um, so this is what, right after we had, this is later on in like 2018, this is my, um, our, our younger child, Raya, when she was a newborn. And I put a camera trap right off of the paved trail near the Oak Creek Trailhead at Bald Hill. So this is just maybe 60 feet off the trail. Um, and this is just a little game trail that went into the woods. And so this is us setting the camera. And you can see that I, that I scraped that little branch there and, and probably left some human scent. So right away, here's a male, I think it was a male bobcat coming through with a bunny that it killed at night. Here comes a coyote. This is why coyotes are impossible to camera trap. Look how the coyote instantly goes and smells. I'm assuming it's smelling my leg that briefly brushed against there. Like it knows that I'm there. Um, and then here comes that bobcat coming back. Um, oh, and then, so this is what's funny. Can, can y'all see this? So there goes the bobcat, right? Same clip, there goes a jogger in the background down the trail. And I actually, we actually got a video of the same thing happened in broad daylight, but 
but I couldn't, I'm, I'm terribly unorganized. I couldn't find it, but so that's, that if next time you're walking at Bald Hill, um, keep an eye out. It's not only at dawn. One of the pictures is I think 5 PM in the summer, a gorgeous bobcat peeked out and waited for people to run by and then cross the trail. Um, okay. So we started putting those, we started seeing bobcats in the Bald Hill natural area. And we found that in the farm on Mulkey Creek, um, it was a particularly good spot. So here's a video of a bobcat drinking out of the creek. And uh, we got a bunch of really neat videos. We got one of a bobcat hunting a cutthroat trout unsuccessfully, but you could see it chasing this fish. And there was like the wake of the fish shooting off. And then it was digging for it under a log. Um, we got pictures of kittens. And so this led me to finally say, hey, I think, well, actually I did spend a whole summer setting fancy camera traps without getting anything. And actually I had somehow a spiders got in the lens of my camera and like had babies and, and ruined one of my cameras. So it started out without success, but then um, I got one of my favorite pictures to date, which was this picture of a bobcat crossing Mulkey Creek with its little, um, maybe like a couple month old kittens in the background. And a fun fact about this one is that, so this picture, I really wanted to show that the creek was in the foreground and give you the sense that this was water. And I was finding that it was too dark basically, and that this was just going to black and you couldn't really register that it was water. And so this actually is not the sun. This is a flash that I put an orange color filter over to emulate the sun so that it would create this glare on the water and so that you could see the creek. And so this is one of the reasons why I love camera trapping so much is because you get you get these little challenges and then you get to do all this fun, you have all these kind of like tricks and way more kind of creative control over the scene so you can do things like this. Um, the next photo I was gonna share is this one, one of my favorite photos ever. This is the um, beaver pond that's just, uh, I guess it's west of the paved trail only a hundred meters from the Oak Creek trailhead. Um, and I spent a lot of time in what I did not know at the time was, was poison oak setting this camera. So I got poison oak for the first time in my life. And we, we, we trail camera, we put a trail camera on here for a long time to kind of figure out this, this bobcat's behavior. And then we finally got it um, crossing the, this branch of the beaver pond. You can see the reflection of the night sky on the water. Um, so a photo that I, was, I, I really was excited about this picture. Um, and then here's the most recent picture of a bobcat that I got, which was last summer. Um, and this is at Mulkey Creek again. I think this is a female bobcat. And I was just out there with, uh, with Matt and Ann Mary and Owen. And we saw uh, on the banks of the stream, we saw two uh, bobcat tracks planted right in the mud by the end of the stream. So the, the cats are back and I'm excited to try to get some pictures of them in the summer. And so if anyone in the audience goes jogging at Bald Hill or Mulkey Ridge at dawn and dusk and you worry about mountain lions, I can tell you, now don't quote me on this or sue me, but I've, I virtually never get mountain lions at these spots. And so it does seem like, I know there's occasional sightings, but compared to other parts of Corvallis, um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of mountain lions around. So you can dress up as a deer and go jogging there at 4.30 in the morning and, and feel safe if that's your thing. Um, However, I, I briefly was getting a cat, um, the winter before this last winter, I was briefly getting one at up off of uh, Mulkey Ridge, but I haven't since. So it, there are very few cougars, it appears like, that are wandering down here, but I guess one could establish itself. However, um, to my wonderful surprise and, and, and joy, um, I, could, I would have never dreamed that moving to Corvallis there would be amazing cougar camera trapping opportunities within 15 minutes of town. When I lived in rugged Wyoming, the camera trapping for cougars was not as good and I had to drive an hour. So through the really generous um, uh, access of some landowners at the other end of Corvallis, um, I've been, and, and, and through them sharing their kind of critter intel with me, I've been able to um, go and get pictures I'd never dreamed of getting of mountain lions um, just right outside of town um, and, 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 and gotten, you know, usually if I get a mountain lion picture, it's just this once in a blue moon kind of thing, but this gives me the opportunity to really like kind of learn the animal's behavior and kind of really dial in camera trap sets to get the pictures that I want. So this is a picture of a mountain lion drinking out of a stream during the summer. Um, 
And this is a picture that has a story behind it. This is a, um, a female mountain lion in the fall. And I was really excited about this picture because of the fall colors. But this cat is actually looking back at a terrifying male mountain lion that we got on the camera traps that was just, just, I'm normally not very scared of mountain lions and I'm okay with taking my kids there to set camera traps, but something, this is irrational, but the look on this male mountain lion's face, like its eyes were like offset and it just looked like it would eat you, which is probably completely irrational, but I stopped taking my kids there when this mountain lion was around. So there was this crazy, just beefcake of a male mountain lion and we got it, a trail cam set at the same time as this captured it. So, so this female lion is, is coming to the scene and she looks back and sees the male and then she continues on. And then I got pictures of the male and then I got trail camera footage of the male following the female down the trail. And then as they get to the Creek, the female kind of chirps and then the male lion like just goes flying through the scene, chasing her and they both leave the scene. And the, the female actually triggered my next camera, but then I got a blurry shot of the male at warp speed, like launching through behind her. So some cool, um, cool opportunity through both the trail cams and the and the and the normal cameras to observe some of this behavior and catch just a little sliver of it. Um, this is the, this is the last picture that I got of a mountain lion um, in that area, and it was at the beginning of the pandemic. I went out with Hayden. And she helped me kind of dial in the, the shot. And, um, and then we got this picture of a mountain lion coming through at night. And you can see here, this is the, the city lights of Corvallis lighting up the sky in the background. This is a picture I was really excited about. Excited to try this again next summer. And so thank you for letting me ramble for so long. That was the, the last image that I wanted to share. And, I, and I'm super excited this summer to, um, to, to I want to get outside of the box at, I always get fixated on the bobcats at Bald Hill because they're so beautiful and they remind me of like an ocelot or something. But this summer, I'm hoping to kind of branch out, maybe go for some owls or uh, other critters. So hoping to share some of those pictures with you over the course of the summer. And I just want to end by saying, have you taken any questions? And there's just a, a long list of folks that um, have helped me get the images that I shared today in this presentation. And, and that's a wrap. Thanks, Johnny. Um, maybe if you stop sharing, we can get everybody on the screen. We've got a pretty small group. Cool. So um, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. I'm going to ask the questions that are in the chat. Um, but then also, um, you could uh, unmute yourself and, and just ask away. Uh, the, the one question we had in the chat, Johnny, was, can you give some tips for somebody um, tentatively venturing into camera trapping? What, what should people do to start? Absolutely. Okay. So first, nowadays you can get a trail camera off of Amazon for like 60 bucks. And from what I can tell, they're, they have better image quality and they're equally unreliable as the ones that like the hunting companies make. Um, and they come to your house in two days. So I'd say get a cheap camera trap or a trail camera and just start. It's a great way to just kind of like get a new glimpse into all these critters you had no idea were in the woods around you. So start with that. And then if you want to get into this, um, into, you know, like the kind of custom camera trapping thing, there's uh, um, a fella named Will uh, Lucas Bassard. I think he was in the um, national or international news for this picture he got of a, a melanistic black leopard this last year. But he's a, uh, he started a company called Camp Traptions. And so Camp Traptions. And it makes it all of the, so many of the failures that I went through um, you can now dodge by just, if, if, if you're, you can just buy, basically they sell a bunch of stuff that, that is all the stuff I used to make homemade that would fail. And they have tutorials, I think on their website that shows you how to get started. And, um, and they have a Facebook group too. And I see now that like the sport or the hobby is just exploding because, um, you know, th they've made it a lot more accessible. So that's what I'd recommend. And you can always send me emails. I get random emails all the time. It's really funny. I, I'm like a scientist as a profession, but I get contact. Nobody ever emails me to read my papers, but I get random emails all the time about camera trapping. So I'm, I'm happy to help people out. And I'll be following up with everyone um, with an email and I'll, I'll find the links for cam traptions and the other things Johnny mentioned. And sounds like he's willing to let his email out there. So I'll, I'll include that. 
Um, this is being recorded, and so it will be up on our YouTube um, early next week at the latest, um, as soon as I can get to it. Um, I also, a couple other things, and then I'll turn it over to, to other folks. One, um, I, I don't think we've ever done a Zoom where uh, we had more people at the end than at the beginning. So I think your, your presentation was pretty great, and your photographs really had us all captivated because absolutely no one left while you were talking, Johnny. Thanks. That's great. One person asked me how I balance the flash with the ambient light when you don't know how much ambient light there will be. And that's, and that's, a, that's a great technical question. And, and the, the concise answer is that um, that's what's so hard about it is you don't know how much light there's going to be. And so you got to kind of, hopefully you have a trail camera. And so you can start and an animal, you can be like, oh, there's an animal that likes to come through here. And I know it's going to come at night. And then you can kind of, or, or at dawn, and then you can kind of build around that. But that's the hardest part. I think some people have this figured out. Um, like I think the people that work for Nat Geo, they get custom stuff that makes it so their camera can meter correctly, but mine don't. So I just go all in. I just, I say, I think it's coming at seven. I'm setting, I'm setting for 7 a.m. light and, and I just kind of go for it. And so that's one of my questions. You, you have your models, your helpers uh, pose, and then you're setting the focus and everything. And that's all, that's what it's going to be set at. When, yeah. it, when it triggers. Yep. Um, and so, you know, what's, what's the thing that's brutal. Once I set, I was on the Colorado front range and um, I had this great spot for mountain lions that overlooked Fort Collins and like Denver up on like the first like ridge line in the foothills. And I set a camera trap there for a night shot with like the city lights. And uh, my friend had one of those cellular trail cams that sends you the picture um, like in real time. And so this was only, it was a 30 second shot. It was only gonna work if the camera, if the mountain lion came at night, but I figured it would. And I never got anything. And then finally I was like driving home from like making another camera trap set and my phone pinged and it was an image. So, it, you know, it was real time and it was this beautiful like evening, like sunset. And it was, it was a, the trail cam photo of, the, of a mountain lion. So it had come at this stunningly beautiful time but because I had a 30 second exposure per night, my camera just recorded a blank white frame and I missed the shot. But that's just kind of, you kind of just, yeah, I think you could probably figure out how to get your camera to meter better, but I've just gone down these crazy rabbit holes trying to figure it out and I, and I haven't been able to figure it out. Anybody else have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious how you calibrate your cameras. I know you've mentioned that you use manual settings. Um, so, you know, for like night and day and stuff, I'm curious whether you prioritize aperture or shutter speed or, or whatnot. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, so I always set to manual. I've tried to do aperture priority and let the camera pick the shutter speed, but, um, without getting too much in the details, like your camera cameras, when you use flash, they can't use a very fast shutter speed. So I, I don't end up doing that. And so I just set everything manual and I say, this is gonna be a night shot or this is gonna be a day shot. And yeah, I just set it all ahead of time. And the flashes are manual too. Any other questions? Uh, well, I have one, one more thing, Johnny, you mentioned um, Nat Geo and some of the um, more expensive and more, even more involved stuff. So in this, you know, in this new era of, of wildlife and nature shows, wildlife photography and nature shows, all these, these specials we've seen over the last few years, um, how much of that are they getting with camera traps? I know a lot of it is with drones, but um, from your perspective and your knowledge, how do they, how do they get all that footage? Yeah. So, um, so camera traps um, and remote photography are, um, hugely important for the films and just like the cutting edge of wildlife photography. Like if you look at the, um, the Natural History Museum Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards, a, a huge fraction of them are shot. Um, firstly, they all use artif mixed artificial and ambient light, almost all of them. And a ton of them are shot remotely or with camera traps just be because of the you know advantages I talked about. And the thing that's really cool in wildlife films is that um, is that uh, this is, I'd like to, so I'd like to get it, I want to get into video camera trapping, but
But I realized the trick is, so if, I don't know if anybody saw Planet Earth 2. They had a stunningly amazing episode on snow leopards. And they had this really powerful scene where a snow leopard comes up to like the peak of, um, I think it's in Ladakh in the, in the Himalayas. And it comes up to the, this peak where it has like a scent marking thing and it like scent marks. And then it like makes this crazy vocalization like into the beautiful mountainous background. And it's really powerful. But what I was going to say is the trick, what I realized. So this is very gear intensive because the trick is to have multiple angles, right? So that you can have like, you have the close up of the feet when the cat comes in and then it switches to the shot of the wide angle. And then it's like the close up. Anyways, I think those folks. So the short answer is that the camera traps are really important and that they, I think they'll have like six camera traps on a, um, on a different spot so that they can then edit together and it, and it feels like cinematic, like they have multiple different angles, but with that, and then the, um, the uh, remote, you know, like the, um, Drones, I think, are cool. They obviously there's ethical issues associated with like chasing an animal around with a drone. But one thing that um, I think has also been big is uh, some, the same guy who started con contraptions. He makes something called a beetle cam. And there was in an almost probably five or six years ago, there was a really beautiful issue of National Geographic where someone took these largely black and white images of lions in the Serengeti. Um, but they were taken with this thing called the beetle cam, which is like a remote control car that, that people drive up and, um, and then take pictures with. And, and, th and that sounds very problematic if you're gonna like go to like, you know, maybe like a wolf den in Oregon or something. But in the Serengeti, you know, the standard approach is like people are driving up, you know, in land cruisers with 10 people in them and driving up 10 feet from a lion. So I think it was less there. It's, it's less, I think, um, of a contrast with like the normal, you know, it's probably less invasive than the normal way people do it. But anyways, I think, yeah, those techniques have been like transformational, I think for, for, for the wildlife documentaries. Well, one more question from the chat. And then unless someone has some more questions, we'll, we'll wrap it up for tonight. What about macro camera trapping? Is that a thing? And have you ever done it? Can it be done? That's it. All right. So, um, I think you could do what's called close focus wide angle macro. And this is a, I'd like to get into this more, but there's these lenses that are like macro, but they're wide angle. Um, so they have a little more depth of field, I think. And, and it's for, it's not for things like a, um, like a fly, but maybe for like a frog. Right. And there's a Spanish photographer. Oh, I should know his name who is phenomenal. He takes just these, let me see if I can, I bet you I can find him in two seconds. Um, there's a Spanish photographer who, um, hopefully I can find him. Well, something I could see on Instagram. Okay, okay. so anyways, he does a lot of, um, of these like wide angle macros and um, I'll try to find his name, but he does them in person, but I imagine that that approach, it might work. And there's someone named, um, Michael Durham, he's out of Portland and he's a professional photographer who does all these, this really innovative stuff. And one of the things that he does is that's basically maybe what you're saying is he does pictures of insects in flight. So pictures of like a bumblebee in flight. And I think he does them with some kind of like beam that trips the camera. Um, and, he, and also he does a lot of stuff with like bats in flight. So I think that could be an example of like, um, of, of camera trap with like a more kind of macro-ish setup. Well, Johnny and I will we'll find some links uh, for the, the photographers you mentioned. Um, and uh, before we say goodnight, so Johnny, how can people see more of your stuff? Where should they go? I know you have an Instagram and I'll include that handle, um, but do you have a, a venue where you regularly post or a website or? I have a website. In here? I have a website and, I, but, and hopefully it works. I think uh, something, you know, it's just one of those things where like start a website and I had a little blog, but it's, it was just hard to keep up with as my life got out of control. Um, so I think it still works. It's just my name, johnnyarmstrong.com. And um, it has some of my best photos on it, but not, not really the recent ones because I stopped updating it. But I'm constantly getting emails saying it's going to get shut off if I don't pay my Bluehost fee. So go soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, now it's mostly just 
to be honest, I post photos to Instagram when I get them. Um, and I post photos of my kids in between. Well, thanks, Johnny. This was uh, fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Um, it's some amazing imagery. Um, it's really meant a lot to us at Greenbelt to have you as a volunteer and a friend and, and to be able to, to use some of those images to inspire people to um, protect all these, these natural places. Um, I'm really glad I could help. And of course, it's been transformational for my kids and for me to get to go explore Greenbelt Land Trust and get to know the critters that live there. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'll send that email out in the next few days, and you can rewatch this all on YouTube next week. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Johnny, and have a great evening. Take care. Thanks, everyone.